I don't know anything about wines. And then Bob from Nobody's just said he would take me through some private classes. I did one with him, and it was a lot of fun. There's so much information out there. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. You know, I, back in the day, I always thought I would want to be learn learned about wine and yeah. be knowledgeable. And I got into it, but there's still so much out there. Yeah. I in in the class with him, I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm understanding this. And then, like the next day, I'm like, I don't fucking remember any yeah. of that. Um, I at one point wanted Eat Local to be more serious when it came to food, and I, I had like the intention of at least getting level one for wine and beer and spirits and you know all these different things, just to say that I had them and kind of lead a little bit more to the credibility when I was talking about food. Um, and then the last two years, it's all been chicken wings and burgers and <laughs> all that kind of stuff, so it doesn't matter. But uh, I think I've signed up for the Cicerone training course twice and paid for it and just n- never you know, completed it. Yeah. Um, but it is very interesting, especially that, going through like the history of beer and different brew methods and all that kind of stuff. Well, and uh, the Americans do it way differently than – the rest of the world too, because we do it by the grape varietal. Yeah. So you can understand it a little more, mm-hmm. but you get into the, any other country, they're blending different. You know, it's yeah. all the same grapes, but it's blended differently. You got to know all that region stuff. Yeah. It's, there's just a lot of knowledge to yeah. to be had. Yeah, a ton of it. Yeah. Do you feel because so I mean, your the work that you're doing is I feel like it's more elevated, right? So do you you feel that pressure to like have to stay on top of all that stuff? No, not not generally because. I don't. I don't know. If the customers are any more educated, be just because yeah. it's elevated. You know. Yeah. You know, we can we can lean on other people mm. with their knowledge. Yeah. Uh, to bring stuff in that you know people are going to be excited about. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, officially, cheers. Even though we already drank. Salut. Welcome. Thanks for coming. All right, so tell everybody, like, you know, well, introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? I am Luke Oten. I am a chef. I am a dishwasher. I am an accountant. <laughs> I am an all-around business owner. <laughs> That's a great, uh, great I, answer. I always say I started as a dishwasher and just kept adding, you know, <laughs> things to the, the repertoire. Yeah. Uh, I own a company uh, called Pure Catering Events. We are located physically in Auburn. Uh, but we travel all over central New York, generally within an hour or two of our location. Mm-hmm. Most of our business is right there in Skinny Atlas and Auburn, yeah. um, Fayetteville, the Route 20 corridor. We kind of tend to hang out in, but we're not, you know, we're, we're pretty mobile, so we can go pretty much anywhere. That's cool. Uh, we do, I, I explain the business like this to a lot of people, is... It's like four levels of customers. Mm -hmm. So we have our day-to-day operations, which is like your pharmaceutical reps will call lunches in and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, office lunches, business-to-business transactions, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mostly lunches. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we have a social aspect, which is private chef dinner, smaller stuff, you know, cocktail parties. But generally it's people at – it's at someone's house. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, weddings is another area. Uh, most of those are in summer and fall. Mm. Uh, it's our Saturdays for the year, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot in Skinny Atlas, but sometimes we travel a little bit for weddings because there's you know bigger dollar figures. Yeah. And then the fourth thing would be like corporate events, fundraisers, political stuff. Uh, so that's kind of. And then whatever else people call and want to pay us for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's another good answer. Yeah. it's uh, So how long have you been doing that? Well, I know you, you were just talking before we started. You, you opened up the, sort of the, the storefront just before COVID or just during COVID. But uh, how long have you been doing the catering? Uh, since 2008, we started. Uh, we've had some different side projects throughout the years. Uh, but when... We were actually doing meal deliveries prior to COVID. Cool. Uh, I don't know. We always like just I throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks, and yeah. then like you know you get it, it turns into something else. And then I, I'm a big problem solver, so like I'm like, oh, well, we have too much food waste, so like we need to open this cafe. <laughs> we already have the building. Yeah. Why don't we just open this cafe? We can sell this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And then it was, of course, the worst timing in the world. <laughs> uh, but. It worked out really great. 
uh, even though it was shaky in the beginning, mm-hmm. we really took a step back, which I think a lot of people got a chance to do, and looked at like, oh, wait, we're spending 90% of our time on 10% of our revenue. Mm. Like, that's just foolish. Yeah. Like, let's fix this. So mm-hmm. I vowed we were going to rebuild it in a way that not only would benefit my lifestyle, but the company as a whole. And, you know, it really worked out for us. That's cool. Yeah. 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 I feel like that's something a lot of people, I think there's yeah. there's obviously those that are still trying to figure that out. But uh, especially talking to like Jim, who was just in here from from Doughboys in Rochester, I feel like there are there's people out there who've, who have, even though it's still a grind, it's still a struggle, it's like everything else that's normal with the restaurant industry um, and food industry in general, have figured it out like, okay, I want to have these days off or these hours, so I'm just going to make my business fit that, you mm-hmm. know, um, whatever that is. And and then there's some that are still waking up every day at 5 a.m. and going to bed at midnight and, you know, doing it the hard way, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the blessings of COVID for sure is, like, people being able to, like, step back a little bit. A lot of curses from COVID, but a couple yeah. of good things in there. It, for me, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me for my life mm-hmm. and business, too. I mean, granted, it was shaky and yeah. tough in the beginning. It was a very hard thing to go through, but we're done talking about it. So, like, yeah. <laughs> things are good, right? Yeah. yeah, we're out of it. Yeah. Hopefully it's not coming back. No. I, I don't think the, the country wouldn't stand for it again. No, not think. at all. No. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. They're talking about monkey pox or whatever the hell yeah, it is yeah, now. But I think that one you have to actually like brush up against the person yeah. to catch it or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to be intimate with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty funny. All right, so how did you get into the world of food? I mean, you know, started that back in 2008, but what were you doing Yeah, so that? I my, my beginning of my, like, culinary career really was starting as a dishwasher. I went to school for uh, business management at OCC, and okay. uh, I would actually I worked in a bakery. Like, at two, I would go into work at, like, 2 in the morning and then get out and go to college all day. Hmm. Just, you know, crazy stuff that the kids would never do now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh you know, that was really kind of how I started. And then I kept with it. I think originally my attraction was because, like, I was 20 and I like to go drink at night and mm. sleep in until noon. <laughs> and then uh, it turned out I was pretty good at it. So uh, I don't know. I just got lucky. Uh, and then I, I got my first, like, real chef job at the Mirabeau when okay. they first opened in uh, 2000. Uh, which was really attractive to me because like, it was a real team, you know, oriented situation. Yeah. And the food was really cool, like stuff that I'd never seen before. Mm. You know, I grew up in the Adirondacks in Auburn, New York. Like, yeah. we ordered pizza. You know, that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> but I, I was really into it, and uh, I just decided to kind of keep continuing with it. Mm. Uh, and so I was there for about five years. Okay. Um, and I then I, I was lucky there because we had a lot of freedom to learn stuff that we wanted, and yeah. you know the specials were on the the chefs, and you guys, you know, bringing in stuff that we you know never seen before. That's cool. And then um, when I left there, I was cooking for. Um, a couple from Skinny Atlas, the Conjels, mm. who. You know, I'd known well now because they'd come in all the time. And mm-hmm. so I just approached them and I said, hey, you know, I'm looking to make a jump. Mm-hmm. And they had, at the time, the lodge out in Savannah. So uh, my next move was to go out there. So I worked there for about five years. Wow. Which was another place that really, we had total freedom, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, cool. it was a lot of work, but, you know, you had... Everything was, you know, top notch and the budgets were pretty unlimited. So you could just go in and, cool. you know, make whatever you want for whoever that guest might be <laughs> that day. But it also uh, taught me a lot about uh, business and hmm. maybe not even, I, I might not have even known it at the time. But like, you know, if Bob Conjol was like a really amazing person at finding people and grooming them. Hmm. And I, I didn't know it probably at the time because... I was still young and, but, you know, a lot of things he was 
giving you shit about. <laughs> he was grooming you, you know. <laughs> but uh, that was a great experience. Hmm. Uh, and but I did see the business side of things all the time. Yeah, in a way different light than being in the restaurant business because okay. that's it's business first, and we're that you know the place was just set up just to yeah you know take care of yeah. cu- customers you know. Was that the place? I don't know if I'm. If I might be misremembering this. Was that the place where the lodge where it was like a lot of it was for like them and like their friends and stuff? It was like, yeah, sort of. And there, there would be like, like one of the big things was like wild meats, like wild game. Yeah, we served a lot of wild game, and we butchered okay. all our own meats and stuff there. It was, was like hunting preserve. Yes. Okay. I'm yeah. trying to think who it was I just interviewed. in the paper the other day because they were they're selling it. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think who the other chef was I was talking to that worked there. Um, Chris Uihara. Uh, hmm. Shit, that's gonna drive me crazy. Yeah. Anyways, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of even who is even still around. Stephen Pontillo, mm-mm. maybe. Was Stephen at um, the Craftsman? No, I don't think so. Actually, he wasn't on the podcast, so maybe it maybe went with him. Nah, I forget. Uh, there's been a lot of yeah. chefs that have come out there and worked different events yeah. and stuff. Okay. And, you know, we had kind of an open door policy there where you could, uh, it, we welcomed other chefs in a lot to, to come in and yeah. just do stuff, work events, or if they wanted to experiment on some of their stuff. Okay. You know, there was, cool. we were able to gain knowledge from that too. So, yeah. It's kind of that open door policy. It's an amazing place if you ever get a chance to go see it. Yeah. Is it open to the public or is it just like a private? Private. Thing? Yeah. Okay. Completely cool. private. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, man, that's going to drive me crazy. Anyways, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm wondering who it was. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening to this, <laughs> an idea. I don't think it was Steve Samuels. I don't think it was Steve. <sighs> Steve didn't. I mean, Steve's probably been out there. Yeah. I'm sure he has. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Um, yeah. All right. So you, so you were there for five years. Yeah. Yeah. And then that leads you to your spot. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah. What better time to open a business <laughs> than a uh, financial crisis? Yeah. I had a furniture store in 2008, yeah. so I don't know which was worse, but um, um, I think furniture was actually probably worse than restaurant, but both probably I, rough. For me, I didn't matter. Like, I was poor anyway. I was like, who cares, right? So, like, was, and, it, and it's not a money thing for me. I like the freedom of it. Yeah. Uh, it's a lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, we opened it up. I had a business partner at the time. We had both gotten laid off. Okay. Because... You yeah, know, retail is terrible. Yeah, uh, so we just started pecking away at it, and our original business plan was to market towards wineries mm. in the Finger Lakes. It's pretty close to where we are. Yeah, um, do weddings at wineries, and we did that for a while. We still do that, mm-hmm. um, but we've phased more north now because mm. you know it's tough to do weddings at wineries because they they don't want to close to their business. Yeah. So you're you're limited on time yeah. to get something done. For sure. And we're not against it. We still do a lot of work with wineries, but most of our business is a little closer to home, so. Yeah. But we did that for a few years just doing winery weddings mm. and we would go far. I bought a huge like 40 foot kitchen trailer we just pull up with. <laughs> wow. But I learned a lot of from my mistakes. <laughs> Still sure. learning from mistakes. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, I couldn't. I could not imagine having a um, a business like start like starting that business. It's one thing to be in there. It's like have a restaurant. It's a completely another thing to then be like a mobile. You know, have to do so much of it on the yeah. road because you had so many more painful aspects to your logistics. Of, oh yeah. You know, uh, maybe it's easier for planning, you know, how many guests you're going to have, but obviously a hell of a lot different when you're having to bring everything with you. Yeah, the physical work of it is probably a, a, a considerable more. Yeah. But the, the reason I like it is, one, when it's over, it's over. Yeah. I get to do something new every day mm-hmm. and something different. That's cool. Um, it's predictable. Mm-hmm. Like 100% we know what we're going to do almost every week, you know. Yeah. So there's no real waste to it. Like you're not buying extra stuff just in case people show up. Yeah. You know, we don't run out of stuff. We we can buy the exact. So it's just it's an easier 
business model than yeah. a restaurant, especially in an area where we just don't have that much population, right? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, yeah. no, we don't. Yeah. So, what were some of your, I mean, coming up the way you did, did you have like, I mean, did you have, ex- was there, was there family members that were in the restaurant industry? Did, were, were there like, um, people that you looked up to that were chefs and that sort of a thing, or was it just like kind of the job that kind of led into? I think it was the job a lot. Like I was into food, um, like, but like growing up, my mom was a terrible cook. Uh, you know, she could make turkey dinner and yeah. mashed potatoes. That was about <laughs> it. Uh, maybe that's why <laughs> I was trying to feed myself. Um, I don't know. I think I was like enamored by the 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 camaraderie and like you know you're it's almost like going to war yeah. when you're in the restaurant setting which for sure i don't want to do ever again yeah. <laughs> but uh actually yeah. that's not true i like to do it like once a year yeah to remember why i don't do that <laughs> <laughs> um i like the excitement of it like line cooking is fun yeah it is. really yeah once a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I'm, I'm too old to do it now. Yeah. It's definitely a young man's game. Um, yeah. I think that's what drew me in originally. And then, I don't know, just got inspired by so many other people watching what they did. And, mm. you know, it's, and I always used to say that at least I'll never go hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. There is something exciting about like getting inspired by, or having something creative unlocked with food because it really is so accessible. I mean, you know, most people have everything that they need, you know, to a certain degree and uh, to make great food. And then it's really just being having to go to the store and buy it. And um, it's not like it's an expensive, you know, I might like annoy some people with this. It's not an expensive art form to really get into, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not like you have to go out and buy all the paint brushes and the paints and the easel and the canvas and, you know, then try and, you know, whatever your prop or whatever the hell it's going to be. It's not photography where you have to go buy a camera or, or anything like that. But, uh, you know, and then you get to consume it as soon as you're done. <laughs> you know? So um, hopefully it's good. But um, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it, it's there's a lot of instant gratification with food. So sure. like, it's like when you go and mow your lawn. Yeah. And you look at it afterwards, you're like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> like, except you get to eat it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. So what were your, when you were like, so you're going into Mirabeau, you're, you know, you kind of have this freedom and, you know, to kind of explore and stuff. Were there people, were there like chefs um, or were locally or even just, you know, like in the the big national spotlight that were like inspirations or, or you know, like what were what were the things that shaped you back then that you kind of have today? I mean, the first thing was, uh, well, Ed Morrow. Yeah. Um, he was very good to me. Uh, Dan Iancello was a great chef. He worked with me at Savannah. Mm. Um, but the first thing that really inspired me was the French Laundry Cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is a, true for a lot of chefs. For sure. Because it was the first one to come out. Um, and I c- kind of came up in that area where, like, the Food Network was, like, just coming out. Like, mm-hmm. it was Emerald. And, yeah. You know. so Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but the French Laundry Cookbook was definitely one of them. Um, and I had stacks of, I still have that cookbook, too. <laughs> but uh, I think it was, like, definitely, like, there was just so much to explore there. Yeah. And I travel a lot still to this day. So I was always like picking my vacations based on like, where do I want to eat? Right. So I would go to, you know, New York city to eat at this guy's restaurant or whatever. Yeah. Um, Mm. food vacations, I call them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Those are nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I try, I feel that way when I, I feel that way a lot, actually, just trying to map places out to go check out. Um, uh, but it's always nice going to like whenever I plan a trip down to New York city and really trying to jump into research What's down there? Who's on my list of places I haven't been to that I really want to check out, hoping that they're open the same days that I'm going to be down there at the same times, and then trying to figure out what's nearby. Um, My last trip to New York City, my last two trips to New York City, though, I screwed up, and I was like, I was in, I have have the list of six places to go check out, and all places I'd been following, but they were, every single one of them was in a different polar opposite end of the city that I was not in, so... I was, you know, from flying into JFK out to out to the Bronx to Queens 
down to Park Slope, over to Times. I mean, I was just all over. Oh, that's it. exhausting. It was, it was ridiculous. Where'd you go? Um, so we went to Utopia Bagels, um, which is the Rainbow Bagel. I think I don't know if they were were they the ones that started the. I think so. Okay, so is that right across from uh, MSG? No, um, Utopia. Well, they just opened up a second location, so it might be. I don't know where the second one is. Um, Utopia is in the Bronx, and it's um, uh, or no, is it? No, I'm sorry, it's in Queens, and uh, it's it's a it's kind of a weird. You almost feel like you're in like a New Jersey like shopping center almost. Um, but, you know, you go in there and they've got like the whole dried white fish, you know, like tons of them in the display case. And um, I, th- I found them just through social media popularity because they've got like a, hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, and one of their owners, the he's always, whenever he's on camera, he's always like, he's like, there's only a good bagel of it can do the knock test, you know. Um, but just went down there and got like bagels and locks. Oddly enough, cheaper than I've had it here in Syracuse. Oh, way, I believe but it, obviously yeah. way better. Um, but, uh, so we went there and then it, that was like early because we fly in. If I go to the city, I try to f- leave Syracuse by like whatever the earliest flight is. Sometimes it's like six thirty in the morning. So by the time I get into the city, it's seven thirty eight o'clock. So anyways, we were there, but then I wanted to go to GNR Delhi in the Bronx. So then we're going over to GNR Delhi and that's like 45 minutes away. And I'm getting a chicken cutlet sandwich at 9 AM after I just had a bagel. And then we were down in... Park Slope at Luigi's Pizza from there. We were over in Times Square. I forget why we were in Times Square. Then we were down in Little Italy at the Cannoli. I mean, it was just all over the yeah. fucking place. You know, it was crazy. I tried to the last time I went down there. I was like, all right, I'm going to wherever. You know, I'm going to Greenbush and I'm not leaving Greenbush. And then like I get there, I'm like, where, where the fuck am I going to eat? Like, you know, there's like about three places I want to go to. And I've been there in the last hour and a half and I have to kill another 12 hours. <laughs> um, so I still wound up going all over the place. Yeah. I was up in Greenpoint and, uh, and I got, <clears> somebody <throat> was like, you need to go check out this restaurant down in Bayside. And, and then I'm like all the way down at the end of, you know, the opposite end of Brooklyn. Uh, it's expensive. It's stupid expensive. Oh, yeah. And a lot of time traveling <laughs> to and from places, but, but there's nothing like going to New York city to spend a day eating. I'm going to La Berta Den next week. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I had to like wait to get a reservation. Like you have to like wait on the the whatever the twenty eighth day before the oh, they okay. open up for the month or whatever. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So I was lucky to get a reservation there. That's pretty cool. Um, what do you fly down or you drive down? Uh, usually I'll just drive. It's about yeah. the same amount of time, yeah. honestly. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I just drove the last visit. I went down. I was just I was down for the fancy food show. And I drove that time. That was the first time I drove and drove into the city. And it's not bad. Oh, it's not terrible. It wasn't bad at all. They don't really like cars down there anymore, but they yeah. don't. as long as you can drive aggressively, it's fine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I didn't realize that they had traffic lights in every fucking corner though, oh, for yeah. red lights. And I got like three tickets. So that wasn't fun. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, because you ran, ran the lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> My brother who lives down there is in the passenger. He's like, he's like, that's a ticket. I was like, what are you talking about? It's like, there's cameras at every intersection oh, in the yeah. city. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fun. Um, all right. So, I mean, you know, what's it like been, what's it been like over the last like year or two? I feel like I hear the more and more I hear catering companies are getting out of the business in, in central New York. Have you noted, like, have you, has it been like crazy dealing with like their pickup in business or have you noticed? So we have been, uh, let's see. So let's, let me think. So last year, so this year we're probably about even with last year, uh, Last year we added about twenty percent. Wow! Uh, I would say we're slowly growing a little bit more. Yeah, um, we can only do so much more business. I yeah. mean, because you know we do most of our business between June and January. Yeah. There's only so many Saturdays. Right. So many, <laughs> so many, you know, like, yeah. Sure. Yeah. We don't. We don't want to take it to the point where. We're suffering with quality right. because we take on too much. Yeah, and you know we only have a certain number of people, so mm-hmm. we could add to it a little bit. Yeah, but you know, I think that you know we we see the growth in stuff that leaves the building without people mm-hmm. more than anything. Yeah, because you know in the summertime we're doing thirteen, fifteen events. A week. Wow. So to do more, 
Yeah. I don't, you know, like I know Dan's going, taking and turning the bakery into the, or the catering kitchen into a bakery or whatever. Yeah. Which I don't blame him. I think that's good for him. Yeah. You know, because it is hard. Yeah. To do both. Um, hmm. Whereas we concentrate on just that event and it seems to work out good for us. That's cool. There's way more work out there than there is people to do it. Hmm. That's interesting. But I mean, if you look around, especially by us. Yeah. And even here. I mean, there's just a lot of venues out there that people think, oh, well, I have a barn. Like, <laughs> let me just rent it to people. And people will pay for it. So, like, yeah. that's what people want. Yeah. And then, you know, they don't tell them. They offer no services with it. Yeah. Other than here's the space. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know. Yeah. They call us. <laughs> yeah. You know, and... You know, we can only do so many. Yeah. I remember when my wife and I were getting married, um, which we've been coming up on six years. Um, we looked at Kester Homestead mm -hmm. and gorgeous space. Like, we fell in love with it. Um, but there was, like, nothing. You know, to bring everything in. Yeah. And that was a challenge. We wound up going with Emerson Park yeah. Pavilion. I don't know who, the sh who, who was doing the food there at the time. Um, that was like six years ago. Six years ago, I think it's the ago. same people ish. Okay, uh, was it Joe or I don't know who it was because I thought that they had their own, but now I know that they don't. That they they contracted it out. Yeah, uh, so they have uh, it's contracted out to right now. It's A and M Catering, mm -hmm. but uh, which used to be part of Joe's out of Ithaca. Okay, gotcha. they put it on an RFP like every couple of years. Just but yeah. they've been doing a pretty good job, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did family style. The food was good, yeah. you know, for a wedding. Um, we, uh, my first ever, ki my first ever kitchen job besides working for my dad, my parents' diner when I was like nine, was a third shift cook at Denny's on West Genesee Street when I was eighteen. I just graduated high school. I needed money over the summer to move away, and so that summer I went and cooked third shift at Denny's, and that was an experience. I bet um, <laughs> all the drunk people, right? Oh my god, that was. <laughs> I applied for a waiter position and in the interview, the manager was like, I feel like you'd be a better cook. And I was like, okay, sure. You know, what's the, what's the shift? And they were like, it's third shift. And for some reason at 18, I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and that was, I, I loved it. You know, I only, it was just for those four months, but it was still fun um, to be up all night, you know, cooking and working when everybody else is asleep was, you know, or most other people were asleep. Um, was a lot of fun and and learning that when you get off a third shift, if you don't go to bed in those first couple hours, you're up for the rest up, of the yeah. day. <laughs> if you make it to ten, it's hard to go to sleep after that. I bet. Um, but then I was away for like two years. I moved back to Syracuse and I did a couple gigs for Tiffany's Catering mm -hmm. and a couple weddings. One of them was out at, on Lord's Camp and. Uh, those were fun, but those were like the wild. I feel like Tiffany's was like the wild west of catering companies. Again, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I've heard things, but you know, I, I don't yeah. either. Are they still around? Mm -mm. No, okay. Then yeah, they. I've heard things. I don't know if Howard's still alive or not. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there are a lot of people that do go into the catering business mm -hmm. because I, I don't know if it's because it's easy to start or. You know, people say, oh, you know how to cook. Like, yeah. <laughs> so needless to say, there's a lot of people that are in, that do go into this catering business that yeah. are like, uh, to the point where I almost sometimes I'm like, I hate using the word catering. Yeah, for sure. Because it's associated with yeah. that. Some, yeah, <laughs> that, exactly. <laughs> and we do, actually, we do work at Lord's Camp a lot still. Yeah. Uh, it's a great place. It really is a cool venue. Yeah. For, like, this is a, this is a wedding out there and my my gig for the day at like 21 actually i think i don't even think i turned 21 yet i think it was 20. my gig for the day was following the bridal party around with like and making sure that they always had a drink in their hand yeah and uh and that's what i did for like five hours is <laughs> just followed the bridal party around and made sure that they constantly had <laughs> wine or a cocktail or beer yeah um and then, you know, packed up at the end of it, at the end of the day. But yeah, I did like four or five gigs with him. My dad was, was like helping to cook with Howard for Howard at the time. And, and, um, yeah, but I mean, that was just, you know, that was, that was like the quintessential kind of what you're talking about of like what people think when they think of like gritty catering businesses, yeah. that was Tiffany's catering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't exactly operate that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
I mean, who, I mean, you've got to be, you probably have to stand at the top of like the higher end catering services in central New York, right? I mean, especially Dan and Teresa getting out of the game. Yeah, I mean, he's, Dan's a friend of mine. He, if uh, there's only one other person that I would recommend Mm -hmm. and it would be Dan. Uh, Other than that, I mean, there's a few good people in Rochester. Yeah. Uh, No, I don't, I don't even. There's uh, by us. There really is nobody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of barbecue guys, and there's people that do it. Right. But not to the scale that we will. Um, you know, we have. You know, we have a lot of employees. Most people are these other ones. Are well, they'll come in and drop food for you. Yeah. But you know, we we staff events and yeah, yeah. do the whole thing. Um. So all right. So being in in this side of the industry. Is it, um, do you have sort of like a more like 10,000 foot, 3,000 foot view of kind of the restaurant industry than maybe you would, like, I would think somebody like that's in a kitchen five, six nights a week would have? Not that you're not in the kit, probably in a kitchen five, six nights a week, but you know. Uh, So are you saying, do I have a, a, do you have a bird's eye view of the restaurant business? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you mean other people's businesses. Yeah, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. I don't try to like compare or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like, I could definitely. I know what people think. Yeah, and what is actually happening mm-hmm. are not the same thing. A lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, it's often like people are like, "Oh, he's made of money. Look at how busy, busy he is." <laughs> you need a lot of money. Yeah, you need a lot of money to run a restaurant <laughs> or any food business, any business in general. Like, yeah. You know, like I've, I've, people think like, oh, it's, well, he, he made a million dollars last year. No, he didn't. <laughs> you know, a million dollars is not enough. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. You not know, you're, today. Not, not anymore. Yeah. It's not even close to enough. Mm-hmm. You know, you can make money on a million dollars. Yeah. But you're not rich mm-hmm. by any means. We uh, just, yeah, for sure. I mean, for there de- there's definitely certain things that have, you know, by and large most that have gone through the roof, especially over the last like year or two. Um, we just did, you know, we did a, a 50 cent wing promotion at a client's for Bill's games to just try and get people in. And we had a food truck come in to do it. And his cost on them is like 54 cents before yeah. the sauce and the labor and the oil and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, yeah, that's, you know, people are like, wow, you sold so much, you know, you sold 20 cases of wings. You must have made so much money. And it's like, eh, actually, I lost like 300 bucks today. One of the worst things I think that ever happened to the restaurant business years ago was people started competing on price. Yeah. And price only. And I think that there is a market for that stuff, but you can, you're, you're just shrinking your margins. If you could, you know, compete on quality yeah. or value yeah. rather than just the lowest price, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because now even McDonald's is... The same price is probably the mom and pop place, and there's people are still going to McDonald's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, without a doubt, the place, the 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 uh, fast food places are as expensive, if not more, than most of these places in town. Um, and yeah, it gets it's getting crazy. I do. I'm a, I'm a worried though that like if you know that we're just gonna we're already back. I don't know if we were completely out of like the race to the bottom in terms of price over the past couple of years, but definitely like first coming out of COVID, it felt like people weren't as concerned about it, you know, about like spending money on going out to eat. Now, obviously it's wicked expensive. So people are, and I feel like that might continue where like there's still a continued race to the bottom, yeah. you know, it is tough running marketing for restaurants when I know somebody else in town is advertising a 75 cent wing night. And then a client's like, "Hey, we're gonna do a dollar wing nights," and it's like, "Fuck, that's we're not gonna." I, how, how do you want me to really market that? You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I honestly, I think I, I really don't understand how a lot of these places are even doing it because, yeah. like, and I understand the position they're in because we, you know, the cost of labor goes up, the cost of food goes up. We can just charge more, right. and most of our clients get it, and they're they're gonna pay. Yeah, because. If they don't, someone else will. It's not like we have to worry about that as much. Yeah. It's like, you know, you got to f- get the people coming in the door. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? Yeah. Without, you know, squeezing them out 
too much because you know you you're you're trying to feed not just the low end of the market but the high end the yeah. high end doesn't care but the low end does so you might sure. lose them and keep them but there's less of them yeah for sure so hmm. it's got to be difficult oh yeah. yeah 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 i mean it's um I wonder, like, I think of just, like, our exceptional restaurants in Syracuse specifically and, you know, like, Eden. Um, and there's some other great ones, but Eden, I think, is definitely, like, standing alone at the top. And um, it's got to be, I would say, maybe a little easier when there's not really many others that are competing with you because now you're everybody's destination, so to speak, for like those special moments and dinners and whatnot, you know, special events. My wife and I going out for my birthday, you know, all that kind of stuff, anniversaries, big celebrations. It's got to be a little easier in that regard, even though it's a more expensive dinner than you're going to go, you know, down the street. Right. But, uh, even though it's not crazy expensive, uh, at all, but, uh, yeah. I mean, my wife, we used to go to St. Urban was like our, our like special occasion. And yeah. that was a thousand bucks a pop, you know, for the two of us for dinner and a wine pairing. Um, so those days are long gone. <laughs> yeah. I wish, I wish he was still around. That was a great place. I know. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Have you ever lived anywhere else besides here in central New York? So I'm fr originally from the Adirondacks. Um, I, I, right now I actually live in Idaho in the winter, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, we're we're not super busy in the winter, so I usually take a couple months and uh, yeah, go out west and uh, that's cool. Stay there for a couple months, and you know I'll come back if we need to come back for events and stuff. But yeah, you know that's definitely something I never could have done. You know, a yeah. few years ago with everything running and you know yeah. it's just constant grinding stuff. Yeah, uh, but what is Idaho uh, like? Uh, it is amazing, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> Uh, so where we stay is like, I'm actually going there tomorrow, but, uh, <laughs> right in the corner of Idaho, Montana and Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So like 16 miles from Yellowstone basically. Okay. And it's mountainous. Okay. The house six we stay in is at 6,500 feet. Wow. Um, with like, you know, 10,000 foot peaks all around. It's so mm. awesome. Uh, a lot of snow. Yeah. A lot of wildlife. Uh, but pretty quiet. That's cool. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Are you a hunter? I'm not a hunter. Okay. I, I snowmobile in the winter, do some skiing and snowboarding. and That's cool. Just, uh, you know. Yeah. Overall. Yeah. We don't have much for winters here anymore, so. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. And I started going there like years ago. Uh, we went on a one trip and I was like, wow, this place is cool. We actually <laughs> went to West Yellowstone, Montana. Okay. And then uh, rode snowmobiles over there. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah. And then, uh, like everybody else during COVID, they're like, oh, man, I'm just going to go work from home, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching these people while I'm, like, just slaving away. Yeah. All these people are at home. I'm working twice as hard. But uh, <laughs> but I decided that uh, I was going to figure out how to do it. That's so cool. So we did. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I remember you guys were doing the – you guys were doing the dinners, right? Yep. The Zoom dinners, yeah. Um, and those, I feel like, were really popular. So the first thing that uh, when we sobered up after finding out what was going to happen, yeah. I uh, first called a couple of clients. It was like, like what do I do? Like, yeah. I'm over leveraged. You know, we're – you just renovated this building mm -hmm. that I can't use. And, you know – it's not like I have investors. We, we spent all our own money to build it. Hmm. And now uh, there's nothing coming in. Yeah. And w we're probably hit even worse because, you know, all, everything canceled. Mm -hmm. It's like, bing, bing, bing. I'm like, oh. You know, so not on top of it, now I got people threatening to sue me for their deposits and everything Jesus. else. Jesus. And I'm like, you know. <laughs> but once I got over the initial shock, I'm like, well, what we really need to do is like come up with a way to, to help people one and make it. So when this is over and come out the other side of it better. Mm -hmm. So really the dinners were cool cause you got it to engage with people. Yeah. Which is something I never do. Mm -hmm. Like I'm terrible at social media. Like it's just, it's not what I do at the end of the day. All right. Yeah. So 
Um, we engage with people, but it was also like designed so that we could share in other people's networks. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't for money making. Like, yeah, there was probably some money that was made, but you know, it was paid to people. And because we brought in so many other people involved in it, mm -hmm. it was a way for us to share in their network and they can share in our network and all throughout. Yeah. Which really in the long run worked out, I, th I assume for everybody very well, mm -hmm. but especially us. Yeah. Because we hosted most of them. Yeah, for sure. But I also met a lot of people that never would have met before. Yeah. That's awesome. I loved, I mean, I, I miss those times. That's one of the things I loved about the dinner at Eden from, you know, last week or whatever it was that, uh, you know, it did feel, it was like, I, I, there used to be a lot more of that kind of stuff in mm -hmm. central New York, you know, people doing different dinners. Obviously there was like this stuff before COVID Mark with farm to fork 101, um, chance back in the day had like, you know, his chop challenges that he used to do yeah. out at the restaurant. There was like the Chibani cook off out at the park, but I forget who put that on. That was uh, Wegmans, right? Was it Wegmans? Cook off. Or food bank, maybe? They were definitely a sponsor. I forget who. I thought it was, for some reason, I thought it was Chance or Mark, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe they were just involved. But there was only a couple of them, I think. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I loved, I missed that those kind of events. Like, the things that really focused on, like, elevated food, you know, more chef-driven stuff. Um, I think because yeah. they were donated, those were mostly charity events. Yes, that's right, yeah. People are scared to ask. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, after the last couple of years, like, nobody wants to be like... <laughs> Hey, you know, I'm, it's coming back. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. I, that's why I was excited to see it. I saw it. I'm like, oh, like I'm going for Kaylee's desserts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Those are incredible. Yeah. But um, the, yeah, but it was nice to see somebody doing something again. And yeah, like it was like I immediately was like, oh, we should support this if we can, you know? Yeah. I'm going to try. I think Rich is open to it for sure to do them something i don't know if it'll be on the same scale or not but definitely something just every couple months mm -hmm. you know whether it's there or somewhere else um i've wanted to start uh, like a fine food festival so to speak here in, in syracuse to represent like central new york for the past couple years it's just it's such a massive risk to try and put on even like a small festival because you either have to make it in intentionally incredibly tiny for the first year or two to not try and take on some massive financial risk with it. Um, but then also just trying to like a lot of those restaurants that you would, that I would like think would be great fits for it. Aren't used to bringing their operation outside of the restaurant and then serving people on a, I don't really know what's going to show up sort of a basis, you yeah. know, or dealing with weather or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, trying to figure that out. But I think Rich wants to kind of lead to that a little bit with these with these dinners is lead to sort of like a food and wine festival, which I would think would gr be great. I don't know if there ever was anything like that in Syracuse. Uh, not that I can remember. We're definitely turning into a festival town. There's so many different food festivals now throughout the summer, you know, like the, the, re like the, the international, so to speak, ones like Italian Fest, Irish Fest, all that kind of stuff that's always been going on. But now... There's the Wing Fest at the Inner Harbor and Pizza Pasta Festival and Taco Festival and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So, I'd, but, uh, and those are great, but they are just a lot of the same people just kind of doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it would be cool, to, I think, to see like a fine food food and wine festival in some regard here. Have you ever seen uh, Outstanding in the Field? No. Oh, you should check that out. I can't believe we don't know who they are. Uh -uh. So there's this group out of, I think they're from California. Don't quote me on that. Um, they basically travel the country maybe it's the world now mm. uh and they grab a chef from the area mm. uh team up with some farmers and they put these you know 200 person dinners together mm. and it's all one long table that's cool it might be in the field yeah, yeah. there was one in geneva we actually went to okay uh and it was raining so we were inside but um Sometimes it's on a beach. Mm. I mean, you should definitely check it out. It's That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. But we should try to get them to come here again. Like, that would be sweet. They did come to Geneva, but, yeah. Um, you know, there's so much good agriculture in this area. I think For it just sure. makes sense. Like, Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, there was Stephen Page, of all people, from the Bare Naked Ladies, and, you know, now he's like a solo musician. I had him on my podcast like two years ago. 
And so beforehand, I did a ton of research on him and just like the band and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't know it until the night before I had him on the show. He actually did a uh, food show called Illegal Eater. And I forget if it started off for Canadian television and then it, I think it started off as like a Canadian television show and then it went from there. But he traveled like he was in Canada and the States. He actually did an episode here in Syracuse um, back when, um, oh shoot, what is her name? Who had uh, Loaf? What was it? Oh, uh, oh God. It wasn't Lo Fi. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, Abigail. Abigail. Yeah, so it was back when she had her restaurant open and like she was on it on an episode. I think they, I think they hosted the, the hosted, maybe the dinner was at his house, but. Grindstone Farm was involved and all that kind of stuff. Empire Brewing Company, they got beer from there. So, um, but it was like illegal eater. It was like he would go to these different cities in the U.S. and in Canada where people were either hosting like pop-up dinners like that in their backyard or selling raw milk when they weren't or having you know an illegal restaurant out of their apartment, whatever the case was. And then he would find these people and like sort of highlight what they were doing. And it was a lot of fun to yeah. watch. I, th- I forget how many episodes there were, but I love that kind of shit. I'd love to see that kind of stuff. Jim, who was just here from Rochester, he was telling me like he got started making pizzas at home during the pandemic and then put on his Instagram, I've got 10 of these sourdough Neapolitan pies available who wants one. And he had like 30 people DM him right away. <laughs> And that led to him and his partner doing like on Thursdays a backyard pizza party. And he was like, we'd sell 60 pies every Thursday in my backyard. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. That, that stuff would still work. That would work today. People would love to go to that. Absolutely. You know, how do we make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> we we got to find the, the, the right minds behind this. Yeah. Or, or you just have to get in line with somebody who's already doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, All right, so I'm curious what is your, without without being, um, without naming, anybody, without like drawing, like uh, without picking on anybody, let me put it that way. Uh, what's your assessment of our food scene here in like central New York right now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I think we check some of the boxes. Uh, we miss out on fine dining a little bit. There are some good, like Eden's a great place. Um, I think the downfall of fine dining is just staffing and Mm -hmm. qualified people. That's probably going to just, you know, bury the casket anyways. Yeah. Uh, I think ethnic food, we've come a lot. Like, I love, I have an obsession with Asian noodles. So, Mm -hmm. like, there's places all over this city that you can get great food. Um, noodle soups and stuff, yeah, which is probably what I crave the most. Um, I think the Salt City Market is awesome, uh, and actually, I, I, everything about it I like, mm-hmm. especially for lunch. Like if you're gonna pop in there and get lunch, so there's people doing some cool stuff. You just gotta seek it out, I guess. Mm. I also probably don't eat out as much as most people would think. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I mean. If I'm here, I'm working yeah, yeah. most of the time. So, yeah, you know. Okay. It's hard to go out and eat when. For sure. You know, we the, we just always have so much food around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I view you as like just somebody who I've followed through social media over the past couple of years. Um, and again, not that like you're on there posting, you know, your daily life and that kind of stuff. But uh, um I view you as like definitely one of the doers, but also like one of the connoisseurs, you know. Um, and maybe that's just my inaccurate uh, image of you as a as a you know the person at the helm of the catering company. But um, you know, like I've I, I kind of, I've been like, oh, he he must be one of the lucky ones. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that I'm a connoisseur by any means. I like yeah. I like everything. Uh-huh. Um, you know, St. Urban was the best. Yes. Um, it wasn't my favorite, but it was the best. Yeah. I'm trying to think of who's doing like fine dining anymore. And in, in our area, no one. No one, right? I mean, Eden is the closest that you're going to get. And as much as I love everything that Eden's doing, they're not fine dining. You know who's the best? It's uh, Taylor and the Cook. That's true. Yeah. That I mean, he's true. got, he's remarkable. Yeah. 
Um, I would say he was probably in this, if you count Utica. Yeah, for sure. He's very good. Yeah. Yeah, he is very good. I, I, I haven't been to the new place. Um, and But, yeah, Tim's doing great work out there. Um, and he's part of I – th- I forget. I don't know the all the details. I think he's part of a restaurant group out there now. Utica, and if 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 I don't know, maybe not. If you if you count all of the variety of like ethnic cuisines that Syracuse has into the mix, I guess I, I wouldn't put Utica above Syracuse. But if I just if I just immediately within like thirty seconds think of the like the hit places in between Syracuse and Utica. I would put Utica above Syracuse in terms 100%. of the food scene. You do have you do have nice restaurants like Taylor and the Cook, um, Ocean Blue. It's not like fine dining, but it is a, a more beautiful restaurant than anything that exists in the city of Syracuse um, on the rooftop. And you can go back and forth on their food. Some days it's great, some days it's not. Um, uh, but then you've got Roosters out there, perfect smash burger. You know, you know, just kind of walk in they take cards now but it still feels like a cash only place you got oskin eats the second oldest pizzeria in the country um you got slice pizza shop out there making some of the better pizzas i've ever had before um you've got is it modus that's out there another mm-hmm. like elevated place um yeah i mean you, like, know. I, you would you would call utica a food town yes like, for sure you would not call syracuse a food town necessarily no, I don't think I would. Um, if somebody just asked me, like, real quick, like, hey, name the fir- name the top five towns or cities in New York State to go for, like, a great food scene, Syracuse would not be on that list. No. No. What would it be? Um, New York City, obviously, is number one. I mean, yours uh, for obvious reasons, because um, you cover every single basis, every single cuisine from the nicest restaurants in the world to the shittiest restaurants producing incredible food in the, way yeah. in the world. Um, second, from what I've experienced, I would say is Buffalo. Um, Buffalo has a, has everything, but Buffalo is also so big that not everyone that I've talked to in the city knows about everything. Like there's just being like a social media connoisseur of like their food scene and being out there a lot, you know, a lot over the last like month, there's incredible places. Best bagel I've ever had in my entire life is in East Aurora, you know, at this place, at this blue eyed baker, um, incredible bakery. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, expensive, but like shitty hot dogs at Ted's, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so Buffalo would say a second just for size and variety and, they also have fine dining and they have the shitty, you know, shitty, shitty places. Yeah. Um, third, I would probably say is Rochester. And it's really close to Buffalo. Another great mix of, you know, of, of garbage, you know, with the garbage plate. But also, you know, they've got a lot of incredible restaurants out there um, and a great ethnic scene. Fourth, I might say it's like Utica. I'm th- like the only other rival to Utica that I can think of would be some of the Hudson Valley towns, like Rhinebeck. Um, Corning does have a really great food scene. Um, not all of it's great there, but they've got a. It's Corning's got st- a stupid amount of restaurants for a place like yeah. Corning. Um, you know, Rhinebeck's got a lot of diversity in such a small area. You know, just like the Hudson Valley. If you were to include the Hudson Valley as a whole, including all of those small little towns, Hudson Valley is probably third on the list. Absolutely. You know, um, because they have such a wide mix. You know, so if you could include the whole Hudson Valley, sure. If you're including little towns in there, maybe not. But, uh, yeah, Syracuse is, you know, for me, it's like, you know, six or seven on the list. Yeah. Which makes me incredibly sad <laughs> that it's so far down, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, have you spent a lot of time traveling around New York for food at all? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been to, uh, well, New York City more than anything, but yeah. uh, Hudson Valley, I've been to Blue Hill. Okay, yeah. Um, most of my, like, idols are in New York City, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Actually, I went to, uh, do you remember when the Krebs first opened, Austin? Yeah. 
He opened a place in, uh, maybe it's Greenwich, maybe not, but okay. Oh wow, really cool place. Huh. Um, one of the better meals I've had in a long time, actually. He, wow. I just stopped in to see him when we sat at the little chef's table. It's like three floors. Oh wow! But, and, and everything was just amazing. Huh. Um, that was a great meal. Um, I went to Alinea last year. Oh really? Yeah. What was that like? It was wild. Yeah. Uh, it kind of, I was, it was long, mostly because I had driven like 12 hours to get there. Okay. And uh, we were just, happened to be going through Chicago. Mm. So I was like, well, we got to go. Yeah. So it was like 15 courses and you get up from the table, go in the kitchen, do a course. And it was pretty cool. Mm. The dessert, have you ever seen this? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The sugar balloon. No, that we had that too. Oh wait, the big one. The, yeah, they come out and just yeah. like start throwing stuff yeah, on yeah. your table. Yeah, that was pretty cool. It's, you know, if you can think of it as like an experience, mm-hmm. and not necessarily eating like you're eating dinner. Yeah, um, you can justify the price. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't. I say that like I know what the price is. I don't know what the price is. It was like fifteen hundred for two people, okay. one one person with wine pairing. So I'm not. I mean. Yeah. A lot, but yeah. you're there for three hours, too. It's a lot of money, but it honestly doesn't sound as much as I thought it was going to be, as I would have expected it to be. Yeah, it wasn't terrible. Yeah. Um, but actually, I, if I would tell you to go to Blue Hill before you go to... Yes, yeah. I Blue Hill, I've never been, but it's definitely ever since I read The Third Plate like five years ago, I've been, or maybe six years ago, I've been obsessed with it. Yeah, you should go. Yeah. Uh, I, even if you don't want to eat dinner there, yeah. just to walk the property and you can go see the farm and the gardens and all that stuff. Yeah. It's incredible. I remember I, I had just read the book and hearing about Klaus Martens and Pen Yan. And yep. then I went to a dinner at Eleven Waters when Cody was there. And Cody was like, he brought out the bread course. And he was like, and this is this is bread that, you know, I milled the flour from grains I got from this farm in Pen Yan. From, you know, the owners are Klaus and Mary Howell. And I was like, how the fuck do you know about this yeah. place? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say Cody is the person I miss the most of the food of the, you know, the the gone restaurants in Syracuse. Cody and Deefy were the was the places I missed the most. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah, you definitely should go to Blue Hill. There's a that that was like forty courses. Jesus, I had to count afterwards, but it wasn't overwhelming. Like, yeah. and they they it's so like it's my style, so I probably why I like it because it's very very simple. Mm-hmm. But like you can tell, they mind fuck the thing so hard yeah. to get it to where like you know, I always say, simple food is harder to do mm-hmm. because you have to like really put yourself out there and like yeah, and they do the whole thing. I mean, it was it's just cool yeah, and it was less expensive than Alinea. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you watch the Bear at all. Do you watch a third season? Yeah, I'm caught up. I thought it was really interesting that like it was, I don't know, it was kind of weird. It's like obviously the one restaurant, and I forget the chef character's name, the woman who like is closing the restaurant in the end of it. Spoiler, by the way, for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. But uh, um, I thought it was interesting because like she, that restaurant and she sort of took the place or represented Grant and Alenia in the show without saying that it was Alenia even though it clearly was, but then Grant was sort of in the show, but not as the representative of Elenia. I couldn't understand what that so was. So I don't think, I think it was a different place. She was representing herself, right? It felt like it was, but like they... Because he was there in the... He was there yeah. at, the, at the party, but like earlier in those, maybe it was in the second season when, um, or maybe it was in the third season, when the when the cousin was there, like, you know, staging in the, you know, as the, you know, and the staging there. And um, they were doing like a lot of the Alenia things, like the Alenia signature dishes. Oh, really? That I was like, was like, you know, what is this? You know, it's, it was just kind of a for someone who knows a little bit about it, yeah. knows what the restaurants are. I was like, what the fuck is happening right now? Um, yeah, but uh, it must be I didn't catch it. Now I have to go back and watch it. Yeah. So, what do you think if you had to get? I mean, as someone who's you know, you know, spends time in Idaho and you know has been to these exceptional restaurants and and spends time in the city and has her own business and, you know, also has your own food business. It's like, you know, in the Finger Lakes region, does a lot of work in the Finger Lakes region in central New York, da-da-da-da. 
what would you say do you th- do you think is from your perspective is like the future of the food industry that's an interesting question you have 10 seconds to answer <laughs> <laughs> um i think that like healthy vending is going to be huge mm. it's already they're pushing to make that happen mm-hmm. um i think healthier stuff is going to be more popular mm-hmm. um I think the population is going to probably change significantly here mm-hmm. and already has. You know, if you look around in the last 10 years, it's probably changed quite a bit. For the better, you mean like growing or, de- or declining? I think it's probably stayed about the same, but a lot of kids that have left mm-hmm. are coming back. Yeah. And they've traveled to other places and they want those amenities that they had in the big city or whatever. Yeah, And I think that will drive some of it. But also with the Micron, I mean, that's unbelievable yeah. what's going to happen there. Yeah. And we don't have enough people to fill those jobs, so they're going to have to bring people in to support it. For sure. Um, I don't know what their plan is for bringing those people in, but yeah. I assume it'll be, you know, immigrants from other countries mostly. Yeah. But we don't know. There's nothing wrong with that. We've got— 100%. Bad, no. I mean, I think bad, it's great. Yeah. Baghdad exists because of the war in Iraq, unfortunately, and fortunately. Yeah. Because we have this incredible food here in Syracuse. Yeah, no, I think it's great. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. And and so we have to support that group of of people coming here. For sure. Or they're going to support each other, however that works. Yeah. So I think that will add to the, you know, demographics that we have now. Um, There's already significance especially by us, more wealth here now. Yeah. And, you know, it used to be concentrated to Skinny Atlas, and it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of... For sure. Any of the lakes, you know, you and I can't afford to live on them. Yeah, right. (laughs) So they're attracting more and more people because Skinny Atlas is full. Yeah. So where can I buy a house and tear it down? Well, we'll go to Alaska Lake or Canandaigua Lake. Yeah. So, I mean, that... That's the way I see our area. Um, mm. It's been kind of a secret for a long time. And yeah. when people couldn't travel, they're like, wow, why am I driving to the Hamptons? <laughs> this place is way better and cheaper, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a, it is funny to me. Like, I've just been somebody who, in, you know, in my position, I've always, like, thought everybody knew about the Finger Lakes, you know, specifically, like, just the wine region, you know, uh, Seneca and Cuca and all those places. And then as I started talking a little bit more about just kind of thinking through like, okay, I've never tapped into those areas and there's all of this incredible wine and beer and food that exists out there. And people were like, oh, I'm so glad someone's finally talking about it. I'm like, hasn't everyone been talking? Like, I'm pretty sure like nationally people have been talking about this, like not as much as they should be, you know, Um, which is just very interesting to me because it's like, it's, you know, it's like a pretty pure... I mean, you know, I don't know if you, I think they, I'm sure they do make plenty of money, but uh, it's not like you're going to like a downtown area and thinking like, okay, I'm going to make a million dollars this year because there's so many people <laughs> that come through the area, you know, when you're going out there, but there's incredible food and wine out there. Yeah. You know. We used to spend a lot of time out there buying, when I worked at Savannah, we we served only New York State wine, so we would, mm. you know, go up and down the lakes, taste wine, buy wine. Yeah. And when I go through there now or we work out that way, mm-hmm. there's infinitely more people than there ever was. Mm. So That's interesting. Yeah. And you can tell they're here vacationing or, or maybe they have a – I mean, every single place is packed. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean – Do you spend a lot of time in Syracuse? No. Um, I mean, we do a lot of work in Fayetteville mm-hmm. and that area, but not – not typically in Syracuse very much. Yeah. Uh, occasionally I'll come out here to eat or buy something, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I haven't spent much time. I mean, obviously I live here and have the studio here, but I haven't spent much time in the past summer, over the past summer, you know, probably since the spring, like really covering restaurants around here or anything. I've been trying to get out as much as I possibly can, especially into western New York. In Rochester and Buffalo, and it's amazing the opportunity that exists in Rochester for 
food and beverage, especially in like my neck, my my you know section of the industry, because they don't have really anything going on there for like promotion of restaurants. Yeah, people like the restaurants are doing well. If I talk to if I talk to not ten restaurant owners in Syracuse, seventy or like seven of them, eight of them will talk to me about how bad things are. If I talk to ten restaurant owners in Rochester, same percentage will talk about like the industry. They'll talk about like their love of the food industry in Rochester. They won't talk to me about sales <laughs> because they're doing well, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that's not on the floor. I'm sure. Listen, I'm sure there's restaurants in Rochester that are suffering just as much, just as, much as anybody else. But yeah, it is a very is that a Syracuse mentality though? For sure. Overall, yeah, like I, I think th- yeah. They, I, I remember pe- hearing that they you always use Syracuse as like a test market. I've heard that about every fucking city I've ever lived in, and oh, I've maybe. lived all across this yeah, country. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that to yeah, shoot yeah. you down. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. like I I used to live in you know uh, uh, like Cincinnati and Middletown, Ohio. People in Dayton, Ohio is right there. People always said Dayton was a test market. I used to live near Austin. People said that was a test market. Every city I've ever lived in, they're like, you know, we're a test market, right? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I guess that could be true. <laughs> Syracuse might be a test market for like the negative products, maybe. Uh, I just always remember people saying it's negative. Like they're, they're yes. negative about everything. Yeah, we are. And they don't like, you know, you go some places and people lift each other up and here yeah. it's like, you know, they, they knock you down. I'm guilty of that as much as the next person. I'm one of the most bitter fucking <laughs> assholes that exist in, in this part of the industry for sure. Um, and the least liked in the city of Syracuse when yeah. it comes to that aspect. But uh, I, th- I blame more the region. I think there was a book I read years ago called History Makers. And, you know, I grew up as like in, you know, in evangelical Christendom. So and this was like a Christian nonfiction book. And the whole premise of the book was this one pastor took another pastor and they traveled the country um, to the one pastor was white, the other pastor was black. The black pastor had this kettle that he inherited from his family that had been around for generations. And um, his family originally were slaves and they had this black kettle that they used to obviously cook with. But at night, what they used to do is because they weren't allowed to like pray or like you know worship or anything like that um and they all you know were christians um they would turn the kettle upside down and raise it off the ground a little bit and then they would lay on the ground around it and they would like pray into the kettle so it would like muffle the noise so they couldn't they wouldn't get like you know caught and then you know beat or you know whipped or anything and so he had inherited that kettle and this white pastor and this black pastor traveled the country going to like Native American tribes and, you know, just like all these different areas. And they were like bringing that kettle with them around the country. And essentially like sort of in the book, they were kind of pitching it as like a a sort of a like spiritual apology for all of the shit that's happened to so many people in the country throughout our history. But one of the things that they talked about was like the set ingrained sort of like negative mentality on the east coast of the country versus the west coast and part of their equation to that was um a longer history of you know settlers coming over here first and bringing so much shit with them Mm -hmm. you know um and then people traveling out west obviously you know you know however many years later hundreds of years later whatever it was and settling in the west um and that being a difference, you know, in just the two coasts. And I, I, I don't know, I just kind of blame our northeastern region of the United States, Syracuse included, in that to a certain extent. You know, don't get me wrong, there's still a ton of negativity in like Rochester, especially when it comes to like Kodak or Xerox. You bring that up and people yeah. are like, fuck that, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for the most part in the restaurant scene, I mean, I talk to restaurant owners and, and, I'm like, oh, I heard about this place. And they're like, that's wonderful. You should definitely go there. And I hear that from every restaurant owner I talk to in Rochester. And I hear that from like 20% of the restaurant owners here in Syracuse. Well, and they're always concerned about competition and like you have to like yeah. fight for everything. And, it, right. you know, there's enough business to go around. And if you care about competition, you're not good enough. Yeah. That's, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Or you don't, you don't have an edge at yeah. all. Yeah. Like. 
I love when new people come around because mm. it just makes us look better. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that too. I'm a very bitter competitive person and I also think I'm the best in in the area in terms of what I do yeah. <laughs> in our in our in our, my little section of the food service industry um or promotion industry. But I am also a very uh, bitter person when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, that's f- not a <laughs> that's not a positive trait that I'm boasting yeah, about either. Yeah, it's yeah. a flaw in my character. Uh, the one thing I love is when like people get excited over the simplest things. It just shows you like like when you answer the phone, they're like, oh, wow. Like the other guy hasn't called me back in like three weeks. Like <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we answer the phone every day. Like it's like. That's awesome. We still do that. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. Uh, well, Chef, thank you so much for coming yeah. on, man. Appreciate I'm it. glad after all these years we finally met. Yeah. You know, the first time I think I met you in person was at the dinner. They yeah, I had to come up and say hi. I figured I was like, we've talked before, but never like. Yeah been in the same room and i'm glad you did because i was standing out like like and earlier in that day i was thinking like man i've got a book podcast guest and i've like gone through everybody <laughs> and then when you came up I was like will you come on the podcast yeah. so thank you so much for yeah. introducing yourself and for coming on today i appreciate, appreciate it. it um how can people get in contact with you uh you can go to our website it's purecateringevents.com. uh you know google us call on the phone sweet <laughs> awesome thank you thank you